My guiding star during my tenure at the New Zealand Human Rights Commission was the statement that Eleanor Roosevelt made at the signing of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places close to home. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. And she added, without concerted action to uphold those rights close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. And I would always review what we were doing at the New Zealand Human Rights Commission against that standard, because that's what human and rights and national institutions are there for, to bring those rights to, into reality in people's day-to-day -day lives. And the very genesis of national human rights institutions as set out in the Vienna Declaration was to um, make those lofty and remote international covenants and conventions a reality in people's day-to-day -day lives. And that's why we introduced programs, didn't we, like um, Takumanua and Tohono Hono, which were our community development programs. And they were about um, individuals in communities um, and or local organisations identifying their human rights issues and their solutions. I mean, I think the uh, one of the big challenges for national human rights institutions is that we have um, considerable function, mandate functions, and some powers. Um, to connect with decision makers virtually in every sector of society but we have no ability generally to compel change or to enforce our recommendations and the only exception is in relation sometimes to complaints handling in certain jurisdictions. So we have to be expert in our field um, and we have to be credible, we have to have rigorous analysis that can stand up to any critic, but it's not enough to be right. And given that we, national human rights institutions, should be there to affect change, and we're going to be judged not on the quality of our reports, but what impact and outcomes they had, then the question is how do we achieve that without actual enforcement powers, without you know, the ability which some commissions are often asked about, for example, to prosecute. So a constant theme of ours at the New Zealand Commission was how do we have real impact? How can we influence the decision makers? You've mentioned Takumanua and Tohonohono. I think the key element about those programs was that they recognised that ultimately the decision makers in government and indeed in business will listen to the Commission if their constituents if their communities require them to. And so actually reaching out into the wider community and building support for human rights in relation to their lives is important not only for them, but actually for the credibility of the Commission. And um, anyway, we can talk about some of those, some of the approaches that we took in more detail, but I know that you've looked at some interesting literature about how to affect change in a rapidly changing world. Sure, and I can talk a little bit about that, because essentially the literature that I've looked at is um, really all about influencing without authority, without the ability to make the decisions, um, and it's certainly been a topic that's um, well canvassed in academic literature and well analysed and written about. And I think there's common consensus coming out of the literature um, that today's world is one of increasing complexity. Um, we have a global environment that we're operating in, increasingly complicated and unstable. Um, we have policy making that is increasingly internationalised, with domestic policy reflecting those international agreements. Populations are changing hugely, a lot older, a lot more diverse, a lot more migration. Um, and technology is transforming the way everything operates, including expectations of people about how much they'll be involved in decision making. And those changes are becoming less and less predictable in terms of what will happen in the future and even next week. And added to that, you've got a context of many public institutions facing financial constraint and always and enduring um, is the fact that human rights are still not well understood or valued. So that's the environment that we need to be conscious of when we're operating. Yeah, well I think a sort of um, perhaps a very ordinary example of that, but which illustrates it, was the, the New Zealand Commission's 
public inquiry into accessible transport because that was an example of where um, if you looked at all of the elements and all of the issues involved, you had central government making laws and regulating, regional and local governments making laws, regulating, oh, actually all three levels of government also funding or subsidising some elements of public transport. You have quite um, challenging engineering issues if you're going to turn um, non-accessible train stations into accessible train stations, for example. Um, issues of bus chassis manufacturing. You've got the private transport um, providers. And then, that's not even counting the fact that um, a whole raft of disabled people, people think of accessible transport meaning can a wheelchair get on, but actually it's about can somebody with not a wheelchair but mobility difficulties, what about somebody who's blind or deaf or intellectually disabled? What are the issues that enable them, all of whom will probably seldom be able to drive a private car, give them accessible transport? So I think that's a very good example and it's an example too of where if we're to be successful, we actually do have to engage with each and every one of those stakeholders in that process. Otherwise, it's just you know, assertions and claims and it doesn't go anywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. And another factor which um, affects the way we approach things is not only in accessible transport, but in all the issues that we were canvassing, the problems have got harder. Um, I think looking at the literature that I've read, most leaders would acknowledge that, um, that they have addressed all the problems that can be addressed and resolved through technical solutions or by individuals working alone. Um, and now we're in the realm of what academics call wicked problems, um, which are in themselves at the heart of human rights issues. So wicked problems are ones that the literature tells us are, first of all, difficult to define and in fact even agree on. Um, an obvious example is climate change where there isn't a common agreement that it is even an issue. Um, and we ourselves know from the Human Rights Commission we would approach certain issues, say child poverty, and be told that's not really an issue here in New Zealand. Um, so that's, that's one of the elements of it. They're always complicated by the global environment and that makes them a lot less predictable and, and controllable. Um, and they're also issues that have no clear or correct solution. They require a wide number of actors working on them together um, and they certainly require behavioural change and not just technical change. And the key thing about wicked problems for us as NHRIs is that they are essentially the arenas in which human rights are violated. There are issues such as the poverty I've mentioned, also racism, domestic violence, those sorts of issues, um, which are exactly what we are trying to address in our own countries. The other thing about um, wicked problems is obviously to look at wicked solutions, and they do that in the literature too. Um, and one of the key messages is that you are never going to entirely resolve wicked problems. There will always be poverty, there will always be racism, there will always be domestic violence. But what you can do is work towards outcomes in which those problems are reduced to a minimum. Um, it's also really clear that it's about many stakeholders negotiating a shared understanding of what the problem is and possible solutions. And because it's many stakeholders, it means that if we as NHRIs are working in this environment of addressing wicked problems, we need to collaborate and work with other people um, to, to work on reducing those wicked problems to, to their minimum. And that requires us to work with skills that are enabling us to collaborate, um, to engage with people and build relationships of trust so that we can move forward together. Well, I think this provides a real opportunity for national human rights institutions because for those who have adopted the human rights approach, you know, a key element of that is identifying all of, all of the people who have rights in a given situation, all of the people who have 
um, duties to those right holders. And sometimes they're the same people. I think uh, the other thing is that the human rights standards themselves provide a framework or, if you like, a foundation against which possible solutions can be tested. And that, in a world of great diversity, the human rights standards provide agreed minimum values which we should not, you know, and must not um, ignore. So it, again, it's one of those fine lines that national human rights institutions, how to provide good advice, how to engage, how to cooperate, but how to step back from the decision making so that those who we may not have realised uh, are negatively affected by the outcome can come to the Commission you know, for a fresh view of what's happened. Absolutely. And at the basis of this, I think, is the idea of building constructive relationships, isn't it? And that's certainly what you were doing, um, we were doing as, as part of the Accessible Journey Inquiry. And I think it's an approach that we have generally tried to do in the work that we do at the Commission, including with groups who are sometimes antagonistic towards us as well. Mm. Again, one of the things that that we've had to learn is that there are times when it's important to name and shame, where you do need to denounce what's going on, but more often you need to build constructive relationships and um, engage constructively as the Paris principles require, provide advice and guidance, and hopefully to build um, a culture where people in the public sector but also in the business sector can see that human rights are essential to sustainable outcomes, that for business human rights are good for their bottom line. And I think also we can draw on literature, we can draw on the, on the studies that people have done to help us in that, in that work. Absolutely weaving that fine line is a really sophisticated way of operating. Um, we could, should draw on the advice and guidance we can get. Um, one of my favourites is Caldini's Six Factors of Influence and, and we've included that in the handout and it's very much based on um, some basic human responses to other people and how you can use those to help you be influential with them and build relationships with them. And I think it's something that's really important about that is, is about your intent um, in using it. Um, if you're using it in any way to <clears throat> try and be self-serving or manipulate, that won't work. It will be failed. It has to be used in, in authentically for the greater good. But they are tools that we can, uh, can do and draw on to decide how we approach those relationships and build and build them and build the trust. Um, <clears throat> but I think essentially what we're really talking about is when we're going about an issue and tackling an issue, we are thinking about who are the stakeholders through the human rights approach. Um, but as we approach them, thinking what's important to them, what will their concerns be, and what can I do to appeal to them to, to, to consider this issue and consider the human rights dimensions of it. Um, and then making the connection and I think something that's really important here that we did was listen to people, listen to where they're coming from and what their concerns are and reflect back to them to show that we empathised and understood where they were coming from. Um, and then identify common ground across the stakeholders where we can move forward and use that to build momentum. I think you've perfectly summed up you know, what national human rights institutions must do if they're to be effective and if they're to be catalysts for change.